Éjjen is van a bócs és igazságos. Éjjen is van fejedelem. Fejedelem! Éjjen is van ki győzött a gonosz felett. Hála néked fejedelem! Fejedelem! István király. Első király. Egészségetek rá. We are in Kaposvár. Kaposvár. And Kaposvár, if you cast your mind back to the year 997, when the Feyedelem of Hungary, Geza, passed away, it was not Istvan territory. It was Pagoin territory. It was Kopan territory. And just as I say that, a Fakete Machka crosses our path. That's uh, something. Kopan was a pagan, just like the first Magyar horse lords who entered the Carpathian Basin. The ancient Magyar horse lords believed that the next in line to the throne, the next Feyedelem, should not be the son of the king, or the prince, whatever you want to call him, but rather the eldest relative in the family. And at the time that Geza died, that was Kopan. And not only was Kopan supposed to be next in line to the throne, according to this tradition, but he was also supposed to marry the widow of the deceased leader. In this case, Ishvan's mother, Shadol. So Ishvan's like, whoa, 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 my cousin wants to sleep with my mother? My father just died, we got baptized, we're Catholics, I'm supposed to be king? Now Kopan wants to come in? I don't think so, Kopan. But I'm not interested in the nuts and the bolts of the story, the gritty details, because to be honest with you, no one really knows what they are. The tale that I'm more interested in telling is the tale of Istvan Akirai, rock opera. And that was a performance that was put on in the city park in the Varoshligat on the Kirai Dome. And the reason it's called the Kirai Dome is because of this performance. And that was perhaps one of the most notable examples of anti-Soviet sentiment to ever be captured in the theater. And the blokes that wrote Istvan Akirai, Surenyi Levente, and Brody Janos, they were part of a group, a band, called Ilesh in the 60s and 70s, basically the equivalent of the Hungarian Beatles. And they teamed up in the early 80s to write this incredible rock opera using inspiration from the famous American rock opera, Jesus Christ Superstar, sort of the archetypical example of the genre. And they were so inspired by this performance that they said, you know what, let's take this theme of Ishvan vs. Kopan, set it to rock music, and throw a gangbusters event. Rock music in Hungary was an area of maybe potential weakness in the Soviet censorship. Because rock music was sort of seen as this artistic, opening where people could not necessarily call out the regime too directly, but they could at least express themselves artistically. A theater performance probably would have gotten stricter censorship, but because this was a rock opera and it sort of blended the genre, so to speak, they were able to put in a little bit more Magyar nationalism and Magyar independence and themes of that nature into this performance. Why was it such a compelling performance? Why did the people love it? as much as they did. Well, first of all, because it's fucking fantastic. I watched it last night. I watched three versions. The 1984 Eredeti Leg. I watched 2003 Cheek Shomyo, Shomyo? <laughs> in Erde in Transylvania. I watched the 2008 version with Feke Pal. Let me tell you, this is a terrific story. Even if you don't understand the words, the songs are brilliant. Rock opera is this genre-bending fusion of Gregorian chant, rock and roll, a little bit of melodic intermission with Martha Sebastian, Sebastian Martha, Sebastian Martha, whatever you want to call her. A beautiful melodic singing voice like a hummingbird. She plays Copan's daughter, Reka, Christianized, in love with Istvan. Don't tell anyone. And the real showstoppers are the two Jula's, as I call them. Deak Bil Jula, who plays the Taltos, the pagan, shamanic, ritualistic leader. And the man, the legend, the king himself, Vikidal Jula, who plays Copan, the pagan. 
and they steal the fucking show. I mean, Istvan is great in the play, whatever, but he's sort of like a pretty boy in love with Catholicism, wants to consolidate Hungary, beholden to his mother, Charot. But Dayak Bill, the one-legged paltosh, the one-legged shaman with a voice like a blues god, Vicky Daljula as Kopan is so inspired that you're just like, fuck it. Can we just become pagan? I mean, really. The performance opens up with the question of which king shall we choose? Because Geza dies and now they have to choose the old rites, the pagan ways, Kopan, or the anointed successor, the Catholic king, the man with Gizella and the Bavarian knights, the safety and security of Istvan. You get jacked up, you're like, yeah, oh, I'm into that Taltosh vibe, I'm into that shamanic, paganistic way of life because Kopan Vikidal, he's a legend. And Dayak Bill's getting the troops riled up. And eventually they butt heads. Who wins? Istvan, of course, Persa. He's got the German knights, he's got the heavy artillery, he's got Gizella's Bavarian helpers. <sighs> Consolidates Christianity in Hungary. And what does he do to Kopan? Cuts him up into four pieces, puts one in Gyur, one in Estergom, one in Vesprem, one all the way over by Jules Fehervar in Erde, and uses it as a warning and says, look, I'm in charge, I'm a Catholic, the rest of you, make yourself scarce. But the legend of Copan remains so potent to the Hungarian ideal both with this rock opera, Istvan Akirai, and just in the idea that Hungary is this separate place. It's not necessarily the same as the rest of the Western Christian states. It's accommodated Catholicism and all of these things as a way to maintain safety and security, but there exists an undercurrent of paganistic rituals that still percolate within the Hungarian lands today, especially here in Shomorj Medje where Kopan ruled the roost. But Istvan, AKA Stevie Christ Superstar, to be fair to the guy, he did a phenomenal job. And he was able over his reign from the year 1000 until 1038 when he passed away, he was able to establish so much in Hungary and organize it and really bring it in as a consolidated Western Christian state. What he did not do, however, was leave a stable line of secession for his own passing. You see, Istvan and Gizella, their beloved son Imre, was supposed to be the next king. But in 1031, he dies in a hunting accident. Or so they say. I mean, hunting accident, it just sounds like an euphemism. But either way, the guy dies. And their other son, he died in infancy. So, long story short, there's no one to take over. Ishvan had to face down a few other uprisings during his time. Most notably, from his uncle, Vazul. He doesn't kill Vazul like he does to Kopan, but what he does is he pours molten lead into his ears and blinds him. Kind of equivalent to what they do to uh, Viserys in that Dothraki scene with the golden melted pan of death <laughs> in Game of Thrones. But Vazul doesn't die, he's just blinded and fairly impotent and useless. But his sons, Levente, Andras, and Bela. They are eager for power themselves and they take refuge outside of the Hungarian boundaries during the time of Ishvan, during the time of Peter of Venice, during the time of Samuel Abba. And now they're ready to come back in and establish their own line of secession in the Arpad regime. So Andras comes in, he wants his own son Solomon to be named the next Arpad king. When he dies, his younger brother Bela says, uh-uh, I'm gonna be the king. He dies, Solomon comes in, and then he dies, of course. Everyone dies, all men must. And now Geza comes in. And after Geza kicks the bucket, it's time for Sent Laszlo, one of the most famous kings in Hungarian history. The first real competent ruler since Istvan. And that's the story I wanna pick up with after we meet my buddy, Chef Benny, down in the main square of Kaposvar. Wow. Downtown Kaposvar. Nadjon, Nadjon, Gunyuru. Yo, what's up, bro? Nice to finally meet you. Hatotagasht al az e letter. Totagasht. Nadjon, yo. Leg here, Sheb, Feste, Kaposvar. Yeah. Yo. Seb Shapka. Ripul Ronai Yoja. And what's the name of your restaurant gonna be? 
this is going to be the Ruhajar Etaram, which is Ruhajar. the Ruhajar itself, right? Now. So it's like a clothes factory? Yeah, exactly. So this is the Ruhagyar, the old Ruhagyar. They're redoing it. Bensa, his restaurant is going to be in the corner over there, as we just saw. <laughs> wow. The rooftops of Kaposhvar. The old lands of Kopan, Shomoj Medje. Ani Mami Langosha. Shaitosh Esh Tefilush. Igen. Egye. Fokhadmar? Igen, persze. Ja, köszi szépen. Nagyon jó lesz. Kérnék palacsintába, egy kakaós palacsintát. Ó, kakaós palacsintát. All right, so we're here on the Plantan Tree Street with a little bit of langos, sajtos, tefelus, persze, fokhajmava, persze, persze. Gotta get the nice fold, New York style langos. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It might be because I'm so hungry, but this is fucking amazing. Wow. Might be the best language I've ever had. Nemtedom. Njots pont het. Shomoj is the most beautiful county in Hungary. It is. Like Jindere. Like Seb. Nice. Arjun Buskavaj. All right, so here we are at the Saint Laszlo Nemzeti Emlekai in Shomojva, the old capital of Shomoj Medje. Zarva. Shainosh. Tradition has it that Shomojva was the campsite for Kopan who revolted against King Stephen. Istvan, wow. Laszlo Kirai, Sent Laszlo. Lovag Kirai. Look at this bloke, beautiful king. So this particular monastery of Sent Laszlo's was established, I believe, in 1091. That was 14 years after he became the king in 1077. And before him, his older brother Geza was king. And before Geza, as we mentioned before, it was their cousin, Salomon. And they were two fairly mediocre kings, but when Laszlo came in, he really consolidated Christianity in the realm. He was a very charismatic man, athletic, half Polish actually on his mother's side. And he was able to establish many monasteries and bishoprics and really complete the job that Istvan had started just 50, 60 years earlier. One of the most popular legends about Laszlo that you often see all over the old medieval ruins of Hungary is a legend about Laszlo saving a young girl out in Erde, out in Transylvania, where he was conquering the Pechenegs and the Cumans and the leftovers of the Fekete Magyars who remained pagan holdouts during the time of his reign. And the most popular legend tells the story about Laszlo saving this girl. And he told her to grab onto the pagan who was running away with her in the steplands and grab onto his belt and toss herself off. And later he and the girl worked together. I think she sliced through his Achilles heel or something like that. And then Laszlo beheaded him. Anyway, sort of symbolic. He also became king of Croatia in 1091 incorporating those southern seaside lands into the Hungarian realm at the time. Look at these old ruins. Wow, such a mystical feeling being here. I'm the furthest thing from religious as you can get. But you get a wee little tingle in the bones when you walk amongst an ancient holy site. Look at Bensa tingling over there. Ah, koloshto meletej kaponat vaj kisheb templomot. Shomoj Medje to me, it seems like the the main place for both uh, paganism because of Kopan and also for Christianity. So you have really like the dichotomy of the Hungarian religious history centered in this in this region. I would say mm -hmm. that's very very cool. Shomoj, holy place. You can see the whole scope of the monastery here. The outline running around the circumference and all the way out there in the distance you can just make out the balaton. Kusanam se penlatsi. Visat. Well we're in Shomoj Vamos on our way to see the Pusta Toroin. Pusta Toroin. The 
Pusta Tower. That's not it, but that is also a very nice tower. Uh, look at Shomosh. Shomosh? No. Shomoj. Shomoj Vamos. You know, sitting here and reflecting, I'm not sitting, I'm standing as a matter of fact, but I am reflecting. And it's interesting to run through all this history, these stories, these legends of Istvan and Laszlo, and think about separating the truth from the fiction and whether or not it really matters. Because of course, a lot of the stories, they were made up at later dates. For example, in the 13th century, the 14th century, the 15th century and beyond, even to the current day. Copan, he wasn't even that famous of a figure in Hungary until after the rock opera Istvan Akirai in 1983, 1984. And it's very, very Nagyon Erdekes to think about how these stories mold and influence and shape and meld. And I'm just frankly honored to play a small role in relaying them to all of you. Wow, super cool. I can't believe this is 13th century. Oh my God, okay. All right, we need some gear to get me out of here. <laughs> Welcome, pilgrim. All right, Ben, so you've sold me on Shomoj Medje. Wonderful place. Here for our last stop of the day, we're in Fonyod on Lake Balaton. And look at this Balatoni Hatyu. See ya, hojvaj. Fisherman, Horgas. Baratroin in the distance. Oh, this has been a very special, special episode today, folks. I feel a real sense of mysticism and beauty being here in Shomoj Medje and Majorosag, the land of Copan. <laughs> yes. And Ishvan. And Laszlo. And me. And you. Minden Kiefeld. Ooh. Mm. Oh my goodness. What a wonderful end to the day here in Shomoj Medje. And we've got some grocery store tepe too. Some pork rind, some pork scratching. Goes great with the air day, sure. Mm. I don't think I even really need to give this one a true review because there's a view of Batachuan and the Hachu and the lake. It's almost too much to believe. Too good to be true. Siastok, Hatyuk. What are we gonna do? Call it a tease? Can't do that. Then you have no room for improvement. But it's as close to a Kielens Pont Kielens as you could possibly hope for. Oh yes, oh yes, Majorosa. <laughs> vivat! 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 Yoe Sakat, Yona Pot, Yoe Stet, Minden Kinek, Sheta Yuk, Willie Bell. I gotta say, really nice uh, butt for a statue. Spending a lot more time on the Stairmaster than her therapy over here. All done. <laughs>